Hi and welcome to the Elizabeth Elliott Gateway to Joy podcast, the debut episode of this podcast. Good to have you along. Hey, maybe before we begin, it would be good for a quick review of the Gateway to Joy radio program. Maybe you listened for years when it originally aired, or maybe you've heard the slightly newer version of Gateway to Joy. A little history now from Jan Anderson Wismer. She tells us about how the Gateway to Joy radio program got its start. Come with me back to 1979. The setting is a radio studio on the campus of Grace College of the Bible in Omaha, Nebraska. There's a young woman there who's working the graveyard shift. So she decides to write a letter to Elizabeth Elliot. So she sits down at the Selectric typewriter and the hum of the typewriter is in the background as she writes Elizabeth to tell her just how much she has appreciated the book, Let Me Be a Woman. And while this girl, this young college girl is writing this, God plants a seed in her heart that says, one day Elizabeth Elliot is going to be on the radio. In April of 1988, Back to the Bible invited Elizabeth Elliot to come and be the speaker for a 15-minute radio program. At that time, the Lord gave me these verses. I had in mind to build a house as a resting place. I had in mind to build a radio, pro, a radio stick program with Elizabeth Elliot. And David says, and I made preparations. And God said to me, all of this was drafted by the Lord's own hands. Now who is willing to give today with an open hand? It was God's work. He allowed me to have something to do with the beginning of it. And it was such a privilege to get to work with Elizabeth. Thanks, Jan. On October 1st, 1988, the Gateway to Joy radio program went on the air and continued for over a decade. Then the program was off the air for several years. But by July 2013, Lars Gren, husband of Elizabeth Elliot, was working on getting Gateway to Joy back on the air. Before long, the programs were mailed to the Bible Broadcasting Network in Charlotte, North Carolina. Some were on CD, many on reel-to-reel tapes packed in multiple large boxes, perhaps 21 boxes in all, And they were once again back on the air, challenging and blessing hearts on the BBN network on April 14th, 2014. Later, other stations began airing Gateway to Joy as well. So that's the short version of how it all got started, then restarted. So now what about this podcast? You already enjoy one of Elizabeth's talks uh, once a week, and now we're adding this second Gateway to Joy version of the podcast once a week as well. So the Elizabeth Elliott podcast will have two versions each week. So without further ado, let's begin, or should I say continue, this debut edition of the Elizabeth Elliott Gateway to Joy podcast. As Elizabeth Elliott said many times, anything if offered to God can and will become your gateway to joy. Welcome to the Elizabeth Elliott Podcast, encouraging you to face the challenges of life with the joy and purpose found in Jesus Christ. As this podcast series continues, we'll be featuring the Gateway to Joy radio program. It'll continue in the coming weeks as we hear from family, friends, and others who were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. One of the themes of her teaching was the need for consistency. Here's Elizabeth's daughter, Valerie Shepard. I remember her saying as an adult, underneath are the everlasting arms. And so many of you who have heard Gateway to Joy, she always started with that. Um, You are loved with an everlasting love and underneath are the everlasting arms. And of course that was lived by her uh, in her, her expression of acceptance of what God had done. He had taken her husband, her acceptance of how the Alcas or the Kichwas sometimes treated her, her willingness to serve without saying to anybody, look at me, everybody, look at what I've done. She was uh, completely secure in what God had called her to do. And it was not, it was always not about her. And this is what I finally learned when I was about 40. It's not about me. 
and the fact that I am Jim and Elizabeth Elliot's daughter, it's about Christ and what he has done for us. So she, she showed that to me, that God's love is complete. It is, it's not people that we're looking for um, praise and admiration from. It's simply uh, knowing that God loves us because we're his children. And I depended completely on her word. She meant what she said. She never said anything vain to me. Uh, she would not say she was going to punish me and then not punish me if I disobeyed. Uh, her words were true. So that truth is an amazing legacy to me. Completely true and never any silly threats. Uh, she was careful in her work. She expected me to be careful and to do a job well. Uh, if a task is once begun, never leave it till it's done, she would say. Be the labor great or small, do it well or not at all. Service, carefulness, acceptance. Acceptance proved to be very important to Elizabeth. We'll hear about that today as we consider one of the phrases that you may identify with Elizabeth, do the next thing. This Gateway to Joy radio program was originally broadcast in November of 1988, Do the Next Thing. It has legendary Saxon roots. It's linked to an old English parsonage, as you'll hear. After this Gateway to Joy program, Valerie joins us again. She'll tell us about what she thought when compared to her famous father. Right now, sit back and consider the call to Do the Next Thing. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot talking with you this time about do the next thing. When I went back to my jungle station after the death of my first husband, Jim Elliot, I was faced with many confusions and uncertainties. I had a good many new roles besides that of being a single parent and a widow. I was alone on a jungle station that Jim and I had manned together. I had to learn to do all kinds of things which I was not trained or prepared in any way to do. And it was a great help to me simply to do the next thing. Have you had the experience of feeling as if you've got far too many burdens to bear, far too many people to take care of, far too many things on your list to do? You just can't possibly do it, and you get in a panic, and you just want to sit down and collapse in a pile and feel sorry for yourself. Well, I've felt that way a good many times in my life, and I go back over and over again to an old Saxon legend, which I'm told is carved in an old English parsonage, somewhere by the sea. I don't know where this is, but this is a poem which was written about that legend. The legend is, do the next thing. And it's spelled in what I suppose is Saxon spelling, D-O-E for do, the, and then next, N-E-X-T-E, thing, T-H-Y-N-G-E. The poem says, do it immediately, do it with prayer, do it reliantly, casting all care. Do it with reverence, tracing his hand who placed it before thee with earnest command. Stayed on omnipotence, safe neath his wing, leave all resultings. Do the next thing. That is a wonderfully saving truth. Just do the next thing. So I went back to my station, took my ten-month-old baby, tried to take each duty quietly as the will of God for the moment. One of the very first duties that faced me was what in the world I was going to do about the church. We had 50 newly baptized believers, Christians, who a year before had not been Christians. Jim Elliott had been teaching them daily and preaching on Sundays. Jim Elliott was not there anymore. There was no other male missionary. Now, I happen to be a very firm believer in men's taking the leadership in church. I believe that God has clearly defined the positions of authority in both the home and the church as belonging to men. So whether you agree with me on that or not, let me just say that I get my ideas from the scriptures, and that's where I had to start when I got back to my little jungle station. 
I was not going to run that church, but I was literally the only person around who had the scriptures. There was nobody else that could teach those believers. So what was I to do? One of the last things that Jim had said to me when I said to him before he left, what will I do if you don't come back, was you must teach the believers. And so I took two of the young men that Jim had picked out as potential leaders in the church, I explained to them that it was not my job to be the head of the church. It was their job to take responsibility. And I said, I'm here to help you. So on Saturday afternoon, each week after that time, I would call one or the other of these men to my house. We would sit down together, translate a few simple verses from Spanish and Greek and English and whatever else I could draw on into Quechua, and then these men would get up and preach the sermon which I had helped them make an outline for. I would draw out of them their own understanding of the scriptures and try to get them to give me some illustrations from their jungle experience. And they would get up and preach not a very good sermon. I could have done a better job. But I felt that it was not my job to take over the church simply because I was competent to do it. It was my job to encourage these men so that they would become competent. Then there was the question of a diesel motor. What did I know about diesel generators? We had one for electricity, which we used sometimes in the evenings for a couple of hours. And so I had to figure out how to run the diesel motor. I had to figure out how to keep the airstrip clean. I had to pay about 40 Indians swinging machetes to do that, which made me their foreman. I'd never been anybody's foreman before. I was teaching a women's literacy class. We had a boys' school taught by an Ecuadorian teacher that I had to uh, sort of supervise and encourage and pay and do various things that I was not used to doing. I had the medical work. I had the translation of the book of Luke, which Jim and I had finished only in rough draft when he was killed. And I was going to carry on with that because, as I said, there were no scriptures in Quechua, and if the church was to grow, they had to have spiritual food. So I went ahead with the translation of Luke. The grass in the jungle grows unbelievably fast, so I was always having to hire people to cut the grass, to clean out the pineapple bed, to cut the branches away from the trail between my house and the airstrip, and I tried to decide what to do about a hydroelectric system that Jim had just begun to put in, Didn't know whether I should try to finish that or forget it. You can imagine how tempted I was to just plunk myself down and say, there is no way I can do this. I wanted to sink into despair and helplessness. Then I remembered that old Saxon legend, do the next thing. And I remembered a verse that God had given to me before I went to Ecuador in Isaiah 50, verse 7. The Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. What is the next thing for you to do? Small duties, perhaps? Jobs that nobody will notice as long as you do them? A dirty job? that you would get out of if you could have your own preferences? Are you asked to take some great responsibility that you really don't feel qualified to do? You don't have to do the whole thing right this minute, do you? I can tell you one thing that you do have to do right this minute. It's the one thing that is required of all of us every minute of every day. Trust in the living God. Now what is the next thing? Well, perhaps it's to get yourself organized. Maybe you need to clean off your desk if you have a desk job that needs to be done. Maybe you need to clean out your kitchen drawers if you're going to do your kitchen work more efficiently. Maybe you need to organize the children's clothes. I know what an enormous job that is for Valerie, my daughter. She's got five very fast-growing little children, and it's just amazing how those clothes stack up All of a sudden, the children are coming out saying, I can't wear this, this is too short, or this is too long, or this doesn't fit me anymore. What do you do with those things? 
If you're going to save them for the next child, you've got to put them somewhere where you can find them. So you just do that one thing. And somehow or other, the peace of God descends upon us when we take things calmly, peacefully, and humbly as the next thing that God has assigned us to do. About three years ago, I think it was, my daughter and her husband were going away for a weekend and taking with them the nursing baby. No, it couldn't have been three years old. Three years ago, that baby's only two years old, so it was just a little under two years ago. The baby was just a few weeks or months old, and Val and Walt decided to go off for a weekend, and they asked me if I could stay with the other four children. I was delighted. I live on the other side of the continent from my children, my grandchildren, and I was delighted for the opportunity. So I stayed with them, and in the first day... I don't remember ever being so busy in my life. I mean, it was Granny this and Granny that, and Granny, will you read us a story, and Granny, can we have some more juice, and Granny, would you pull my pants up, Granny, would you pull my pants down, Granny, can we have some juice, Granny, can we go outside, Granny, what time is supper, until I really thought I would go mad. Well, my dear sweet daughter had the good sense to call me that evening, and she said, well, Mama, how are you doing? And I said, wonderfully, Val. And then I said, but I'm not sure I can make it through the next three days. And then I assured her that her children were wonderful children. They're not disobedient. They're not unruly. Everything was going along really very well when you think of the way some households are run. But I said, I keep thinking, Valerie's got a baby to nurse. That takes about six hours a day. How does she do it? So tell me, Val, how do you do it? And she laughed, and she said, Well, Mama, I'll tell you how. I do what you told me years ago to do. Do the next thing. Don't sit down and think of all the things you have to do. That will kill you. It's overwhelming. It's daunting. If you think of all the things that are involved in a task, just pick up the next thing. And I find this even in the scriptures. Tucked in the back of the book of Mark, following the story of the crucifixion, we read this lovely little story. Mark 15, verse 42. By this time, evening had come, and as it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, a man who looked forward to the kingdom of God, bravely went into Pilate, and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead, so he sent for the centurion and asked him whether it was long since he died. And when he heard the centurion's report, he gave Joseph leave to take the dead body. So Joseph bought a linen sheet, took him down from the cross, wrapped him in the sheet, and laid him in a tomb cut out of the rock and rolled a stone against the entrance. He did the next thing. Welcome back. That Gateway to Joy program was called Do the Next Thing, which can be a powerful tool in making it through the darkest of days. What's in front of you? Do the next thing. Well, Valerie Elliott Shepard is back to talk about her dad and the delight she felt when she was compared to him. Every once in a while, when I was younger, my mother would say, oh, Val, you're so much like your dad. And that would please me. And, and make me wonder, you know, what, what, what it was. It was mainly that love of adventure, spontaneity, and sometimes craziness. In my father's uh, journal, be on guard, oh my soul, of complicating your environment so that you have neither time nor room for growth. In other words, take time to meditate on God's word. Don't spend so much time on worldly things. And TV and internet, of course, takes way much more time than it should because it it interrupts our Bible reading or our prayer times. And I'm still learning that. I'm still trying to say no to all of the dings, all of the uh, notifications on the phone. Yes, the discipline of our time and our attention to what really matters. Now that's the kind of thing Elizabeth would uh, also encourage her listeners to live by. 
Well, let's consider another Gateway to Joy program now on the subject of discipline. It's called The Mind of Christ. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. We have the mind of Christ. That's a gift from God. But we need to cultivate the mind of Christ. We need to discipline our own minds and not to crowd out the thoughts that God would put there by filling our minds with a lot of nonsense and junk. If we have the mind of Christ, we will be truth-tellers. And as Socrates predicted thousands of years ago, the truth-teller will have his eyes gouged out. So it has been, and so it will always be. Of course, we don't gouge out people's eyes nowadays, not in civilized society anyway. We simply tell the man who turns from the broad road to the narrow road that he's hung up or he's not in touch with his feelings, or he's a do-gooder, or a party pooper, or holier than thou. I was amazed recently. I had a letter from a friend who had raved to a friend of hers about my biography of Amy Carmichael, a book called A Chance to Die. And so this friend of hers had read the book, and his sole comment was, I don't think Amy Carmichael would be any fun at a party. From where does an attitude like that come? I think that any label that will exonerate the rest of us of the responsibility of being truly holy, we will use in order to excuse ourselves. We pity the man's naivete, his narrowness, his unreality. We hardly even suspect that there could be in our midst a few people whose minds really are set on things above because their lives are hidden with Christ. We will get a changed conception of reality when we have the mind of Christ, not only of reality, but even of possibility. If we have a changed conception of possibility, that's going to change our prayer life, isn't it? First of all, we're going to be able to see what Christ wants to do in the people that we're praying for. We will be enabled to refuse hard thoughts about them, some of the people on my prayer list are people that I have a hard time getting along with. They're people in whom I would like to see certain changes. But it's with a great deal of hesitancy and caution that I ask God to change that person or that particular characteristic because very often I think God wants to change me first. So I pray that he will give me the mind of Christ in knowing what to pray for, that he will enable me to refuse hard thoughts, critical thoughts, to love that person, to forgive that person, and to cooperate with God in whatever God wants to do in that person. I was talking with a woman who was telling me a list of her husband's faults, and I said, do you pray about them? And she said, yes. And I said, do you pray that God will transform your mind so that you will begin to see that man as God sees him instead of as you see him? No, she said, I hadn't really thought of that. Well, I said, it might change your prayer list for him. Maybe God would give you a whole lot of positive things to start praying for that you haven't even thought about because you've been so concerned with the negative ones. The mind of Christ gives us a changed conception of reality and possibility. The second change which is likely to occur is that we will be enabled to offer up our imaginations. We will be enabled to think God's thoughts after him. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And the third thing, we will be enabled to distinguish between disagreement and hatred of the truth. Have you ever heard someone say about a preacher's sermon, well, I disagreed with what he said there, when what they really meant was, I didn't like that sermon. Maybe the reason they didn't like it was because it came a little bit too close to home. Maybe the truth is 
they don't like the truth that he was preaching. And as a friend of mine says to her children, when people say they can't, they usually mean they won't. Sometimes God tells us to do something which we say we can't do. The truth is, we won't. It's not just a disagreement, it's hatred of the truth, because the truth is going to cost us something. Every now and then I have the privilege of listening to Dr. Charles Stanley of First Baptist Church in Atlanta. Not nearly often enough do I hear him, but sometimes when we go to Atlanta, we go to the church, and when I do have an opportunity to watch him on TV, I've done that. And several years ago, he gave the formula for how mental strongholds develop. He said, they begin with a thought. One thought becomes a consideration. A consideration develops into an attitude. An attitude leads to action. Action repeated becomes a habit. And a habit establishes a power base for the enemy. That is, a stronghold. That power base for the enemy in my life, the place where Satan takes over, began with a thought. That sobers me. Does it sober you? We need to pray that the Lord will give us the mind of Christ. We need to bring every thought into captivity to Christ, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. We must demolish strongholds and every thought that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. I love Paul's words there. Weak men we may be, but it is not as such that we fight our battles. The weapons we wield are not merely human, but divinely potent to demolish strongholds. We demolish sophistries and all that rears its proud head against the knowledge of God. We compel every human thought to surrender in obedience to Christ. We can't stop the birds from flying over our heads, as Martin Luther said, but we can stop them from making a nest in our hair. We can't control the wicked thoughts that may occur to us, but we can certainly refuse to give them time and consideration. A thought becomes a consideration, a consideration an attitude, an attitude an action, an action a habit, and a habit establishes a power base for the enemy, a stronghold. I found that very helpful, and I've used it in asking the Lord to help me to have the mind of Christ. A woman who had been viciously attacked publicly for something that she had written on a particularly unpopular truth said to me when I was commending her for the courage that I had seen in her when she was publicly attacked, she said, Elizabeth, I can't answer them. I don't know what to say of some of their arguments, but I'm not afraid of them because I know I'm right. Here's a set of questions that may help you to compel your thoughts to surrender in obedience to Christ. Ask yourself these eight questions. Whose glory do I seek? Is this for or against the knowledge of God? Question number three, am I giving my mind to wholesome precepts? Number four, am I morbidly keen on mere verbal questions and quibbles? Number five, is it more important to me to understand than to obey? Number six, is it more important to me to know than to believe? Number seven, will one side of the question inconvenience me? Number eight, do I reject a particular truth because it will inconvenience me? Those questions may reveal how far your mind is from being the mind of Christ. And let me just quickly run through a list of the characteristics of the carnal mind, the mind which is not under the control of Christ. I haven't got time to give you the scripture references, but believe me, every single one of these comes straight out of the Bible. The carnal mind is dulled, 
reprobate, depraved, set on the flesh, hostile to God, opposed to the purpose of God, and neither can nor will follow his laws for living. It sees no further than natural things. Its outlook is formed by the lower nature. It's hard as stone, insensitive, set on earthly things, bursting with conceit, inflated by an unspiritual imagination, tainted and diseased. I hope that doesn't characterize your mind, but we all need to be purified in our minds. Again, the title of today's Gateway to Joy program was The Mind of Christ, part of a larger series called Discipline of Mind, Place, and Time. And speaking of time, before we run out of it completely, a couple more notes. Uh, The Gateway to Joy broadcast was presented in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, Charlotte, North Carolina. And for more resources from Elizabeth Elliott, check out the elizabethelliot.org website. That's Elizabeth with an S, elizabethelliot.org. Well, it's been so good to have you with us on the podcast today. As Elizabeth reminded us, simply doing the next thing in front of us can make all the difference as we face the challenges of the darkest day. Until we meet again, may God remind you daily that you are loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs>